Hello, my name is Tiffany C. Wright and I am the Resourceful CEO. And today I'm here to talk to you about owners as bottlenecks. I get a lot of owners who come to me or who I work with and lots of times they blame a lot of the issues with the business on their employees, their managers, or other things outside themselves. But really, when it comes down to it, it's not everything else. They're not a victim to all the whims of all these external circumstances. It's them. It's often that they built this business. You know, when you're just starting out, you have to do everything yourself. You're building a business from scratch, everything for, uh, for yourself or by yourself. And then you hire a part-time person or a full-time person, you hire an assistant or an office manager, or you hire, if you're in construction or a construction-related field, you hire people to go out and actually do the work. I'm not talking about subcontractors. You may actually hire, talking about actual employees. Um, but you do all of this. And you, again, you also may subcontract to people or use independent contractors, but you're in charge of everything. You're in charge of handling everything. But as you begin to scale and you're hiring more employees, you still keep this structure where you're the primary decision maker for almost everything. If you're in construction, you may have a crew chief who makes decisions about the, you know, what's going on day to day with that crew chief, but you're, or with that actual crew, but you're still making all the decisions regarding the project and so on. If you're in marketing, you may you may have a marketing supervisor who's in charge of the actual output, but you're in charge of clients and customers and uh, the vision and so on. You're handling everything and you're becoming a bottleneck. You're, you need to build a business that can run well without you and that takes time that takes time you need to focus on running the business once you reach a certain point if you're at a million dollars or more you need to be focusing or to start focusing on putting in some infrastructure so that the business can run without you right now i'm looking at purchasing companies to buy and there's a lot of these smaller companies where the owner has all the relationships, the sales relationships, the supplier relationships, the uh, relationship with all the employees. There's no general manager. And yet they want a, what I consider a high multiple for the firm. They want like a four times multiple. I'm not paying you a four times multiple. There's no business without you. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pay a two times multiple maybe two and a half to three if you have a lot if your business has a lot of assets but if you're essentially the business and you have a few employees where's the business and then a non-compete what is that that is that i mean a non-compete means i have to come after you in court that's not going to work um because meanwhile you you will you could have competed taking all the customers taking the employees and so on and now what money do i have to pursue you in court i would structure the deal to make sure that um you don't get that much money until a couple of years have passed <laughs> to make sure that you're incentivized to not compete against me but if you have a general manager and a general manager has most of those relationships and the general manager is staying with the business, then that's a different story. Even if I'm unable to, and so I lock the, the general manager up in, a, um, in an employment agreement. Even if the general manager left after two years, that's different. You know, an employee taking customers and so on is a lot different than the owner of the business taking customers away. It's significantly more detrimental 
for the owner to pull customers away than for a former employee. Although, you know, em employees, you know, employees can be an issue, <laughs> can be an issue too. But again, that's why you have employment agreements and incentives and bonuses and all of that. But we're talking about owners, not employees. So I just, so the, the focus here is on strengthening your business to make it more valuable to somebody who would buy it like me or, or someone else. Um, so obviously if you're a plumbing company and it's just you, then another plumber may find it really, it may find your business interesting or compelling because you have all these customers if they don't think you're going to, um, compete against them. So like if you're 75 years old and it's obvious that you're not going to be doing a lot of plumbing yourself, then sure, they'll buy your business because they want that book of business and uh, they may pay more than a financial buyer like me. I would, I would call myself a financial buyer. I, I, I look strictly at EBITDA and where the company has been and where I think it can go. So, but anyways, let's get back to the owner as a bottleneck. So if you are the management and you have, you know, let's say you have, and I've seen this, you have 10 employees, and everyone reports to you. That gets to be unwieldy. You need to start thinking about, okay, if you have an office staff, let's say you have an accountant or bookkeeper and an office manager, that's two people. Well, then put the bookkeeper under the office manager. So there, now you only have, you've reduced by one the number of people who report to you. Let's say you have a, uh, I'm gonna use one company um, as an example, a former client, you have shop staff. Well, and you have two locations. Will you put a shop supervisor in charge of the shop staff at the one location and shop supervisor in charge of the shop staff at another location? And then now you have, so if, of those 10 people, you went from 10 people reporting to you to three. Um, now, obviously, in order to do that, you then have to put in, you have to be very clear about the expectations of those reporting to you. You have to train them. They have to know how to manage people. And so you may need to train them. Some people are good at supervising and some people are not. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> um, but, and some people are not currently but that's where the training and uh, development comes in. Um, so that's one. Two, another one is systems. Like if, if I come into your company and there's, let's say there's 25 employees or 25 people in the company and I talk to 25 different people and believe me, this happens a lot. This really does happen a lot. And about how to do something and all 25 give me something that's somewhat different that ranges from anywhere from somewhat different to significantly different. When I asked about the same thing, that's a problem. That's a problem. You need to have cohesive procedures and policies that everyone understands. If management creates this, management being you and maybe you know, your office manager creates this, this uh, procedure and then tells people, you know, it has a company meeting and tells people about it and that's the extent of it. It's no good. It doesn't do any good. It's wholly, completely ineffective. So you, you need to have consistency. Well, person A does the job is the same as person C. Now, I'm not saying that it's regimented, like you must do A, B, C, D, E, you know, like that. There's room for people to put their own personal stamp on it. But you need to be able to tell someone, this is basically how the job is done. And this is the deliverable for that particular job. And this is the quality and what we expect. And these are, you know, like, um, let me give you an example. So if, um, you're in a manufacturing situation and you're doing custom manufacturing, then it's, uh, you, you, you get the drawings 
and you, you, you get the drawings um, from who, and then you review the drawings and you mark it up and does anyone review does anyone review the drawings before you start to make changes um, before you start production these are the kinds of things so it's get the drawings uh review the drawings get a sign off from the supervisor uh make a mock-up whatever this is again customized manufacturing get a sign off from whomever is supposed to sign it off these kinds of this is what i mean by steps uh, and I've just seen too too many times when one person gets the drawing and they they get started right away and then they make all these changes or they or they don't know what they're doing. So again, consistency, consistency, consistency. So you have to put in procedures that just outline what you're supposed to do with a particular process, and and then you just build upon that in the in the different processes across your organization. And uh, you create these standard operating procedures. And they don't have to be long. They could just be half a page, a page. Um, but basically, it, it, if someone is coming in, they understand how to do the job. They may not be able to do it well after going through. They, you don't expect them to do it well. But, you, but, you, but they should be able to perform the basics of the job with oversight as long as you have procedures um, in place and you have none, then basically whenever you bring someone in, they have to be glued to the hip of another individual. And again, like I said, if one individual is training, if one individual does it this way and the second individual does it that way and the third individual does it this way, then it's just going to be all over the place. And this is what I see over and over and over again in the companies that I go into is that just the owner is trying to do too much and doesn't know how to delegate effectively. I mean, delegate, not abdicate. Delegate is when you pass something on to someone else um, who is capable of doing it and you provide them with the methodology and the support to do an effective job. Abdicate is, abdicating is when you just say, here, go do it. <laughs> Then you wonder why they completely screwed it up. <laughs> no one can do it right. I just have to do it myself. No, you have to tell people what you expect, what the end result should be, what you expect, and give them parameters within which to work. So this is what I mean by, um, by the owners being a bottleneck. And now let's just pull it up. Let's pull it up to the goals and the vision of the company. The... So many companies don't share the company goals with the employees. And there's all this research out there that says that people who understand how the work that they do um, ties into the goals of the company. So the, my goal and my, or my objectives within my work tie into the objectives of the company. So if I'm, let's see, if I'm a, marketer and the objective of the company is to grow sales by 10 percent each year over the next three years well then i can um i can work with the team or finance team and whomever to figure out what the kpis are or basically measure my effectiveness so my i'm doing a great job with the marketing um, because sales are going up and the sales team is telling me, thank you, my sales, it was so much easier for me to make a sale because of your marketing. Well, that's great feedback. And then you tell me that we overachieved last year. We actually grew sales by 12%. Well, I know I directly contributed to that. So, but if I don't know the company's goals, it's just more sales. I don't, I'm not going to get the same kind of reward internal uh what's the word i'm looking for the kind the same kind of uh internal <laughs> i'm trying to think of the word uh, but i'm not going to be able to give myself a, a you know uh an attaboy or an girl because i just didn't know um 
I, I didn't know how well I was doing. Yes, it's great for the salespeople to say, thank you. Thank you so much for your work. But as an internal motivator, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that is more effective than tying each employee's um, role or expectation to the company's overall goal. So if you hire good employees, good to great employees, and you want them to do really well, then you share the company's goals with them. First of all, you kind of work with your management team and others to figure out what those goals are, but you share the company's goals with them. And then you make sure that each department has a sub goal related to the company's goal. And then each person has their own goals related to the company's goals. And then when you do quarterly reviews or semi-annual reviews, because annual reviews are only reward and punishment. If you're trying to get your people to help you achieve your goals and you're only rating them once a year and you're surprised that they're not doing that well, well, come on now. It's reward or punishment. If you don't track anything for a year, you have a yearly goal, but you don't track it <laughs> for a whole year. Come on. You can't expect... <laughs> You can't expect to achieve that goal. You've got to track it on a quarterly basis and check in on a monthly basis. So quarterly, um, yeah, so they're, so they're getting feedback on a quarterly basis as to how they're doing against the company's goals and how they're doing against their goal. And then they can correct. Do they need additional training? Do they need additional support? Do they need training or support from you or from others? Do they need to be paired with others? Um, do they need something that's more challenging because they're a little bored? Whatever, you can figure all of this out. So anyways, goals. So as the owner, it is up to you to figure out what the goals are and then confer with your team. You have to, who is that team? Identify that team to, to, um, to get everyone to embrace those goals. So it's not a top down. It's a, yes, we all embrace those goals. And then make sure that everyone knows what those goals are and post them. And you don't have to share, you know, I know in a small company, it's hard, to, people can feel very strange about sharing revenue or um, net profit uh, numbers because they're afraid it might be shared with the competitors or you're afraid it might be shared with the competitors. Well, just use percentages. So if your baseline is 3 million, and your goal is 330, uh, excuse me, 3,300,000, then it's 10% increase, right? Or if your profit was, um, if your profit was 200,000 and now your, you want your profit to be 250,000, then it's a 25% increase in profit for the next year. So, and you can share, you can share how, you know, how you're tracking for that. So just come up with percentages and share those and that would be sufficient. So anyways, these are just some of the ways that owners can be a bottleneck and some of the solutions that you can implement in order to uh, stop yourself from being a, a bottleneck, uh, make your employees happier and more productive Reduce your stress and have more inner peace <laughs> and make your company so much more valuable. I am Tiffany C. Wright, the resourceful CEO. If you'd like to have a con consultation with me to figure out how to do these things, what's involved or figure out what your issue specifically is and how I may be able to help, please go to the resourcefulceo.com forward slash schedule and schedule a free 20 minute consult with me. Thank you very much for your time and remember to subscribe and like this video.